I constantly refer back to John chapter 20, verse 31, and I will continue to do that because it has become to me what the uh, star of Jesus was to the Magi. It led them to Christ. And this is John's objective in the Gospel of John. These are written, which accounts for both the signs or miracles of Jesus, but also the words of Jesus that complement those miracles. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, Sister Bailey said, and I've said this before, and I will say it again, that Jesus has come to do for men what men cannot do for themselves. Jesus has come to do what only Jesus can do. Jesus is the only one that can give life. Amen. And any man who's ever been a vehicle through which life was given was the one through whom God gave life. God is the one that giveth life, the scripture says. He taketh life and he giveth life. He's the only one that can do that. And this is part of the testimony of Jesus being the son of God, is that he's come to give life to the world. Everything that John has said throughout John's gospel is simply a different view of that fact. That is the premier work of the Christ, the Son of God, is to give life to men. To give life to men. Now, the particular point that I want to make tonight is this, and I'm going to develop the context for this, because Jesus' word in John 6:51 is a response to the multitudes that he fed and their reaction to that feeding. Okay, so I'm going to take some time to look over that. And then we'll get to the text that, that, that I'm looking at tonight. But here's the point I'm making tonight. That life from heaven is what Jesus came to give. And because he is the bread that came down from heaven, the life that he gives is a life that suits us for heaven. And that's the thing I want to declare tonight. Okay? The context. In the opening verse of chapter 6, Jesus leaves Jerusalem as you know, he did a miracle in the fifth chapter during a feast time in Jerusalem. And any time there's a feast time in Jerusalem, the numbers swell as men make their way into Jerusalem for the feasts. Okay? There's a feast of Passover that is actually getting ready to take place, which accounts for the multitudes that were coming out to see Jesus. Okay? And so Jesus does this miracle at the pool of Bethesda and heals this man. Unfortunately, he does it on the wrong day. He did it on the Sabbath, and he told the man to take up his mat and walk a little trophy for all the weakness that he had when he laid on the mat. Mm -hmm. To me, it seems very appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. But they were upset about this, and that wasn't it. it all, they were also upset because Jesus says, I work and my father work hitherto. Mm -hmm. Not good. Because the Jews knew exactly what he was saying and exactly what that meant, that he was not only claiming to be working with God, but he was claiming to be working as the son of God. That was the claim. And they thought it to be blasphemous. So Jesus leaves Jerusalem and goes across the Sea of Galilee and makes his way up into a mountain area where he sits down with his disciples. Well, while he's looking on, behold, a multitude is following after him. You think, well, this is going to be good. Having a crowd is always a good thing, isn't it? Well, maybe it is sometimes and maybe it isn't. It's always good to have people seeking after Jesus, isn't it? Well, that, like, oh, that kind of depends. Yeah. That depends on what they want from Jesus. Don't be naive about people that are supposedly seeking Jesus. You can seek Jesus for the wrong reason. Yeah. And we're going to see that right here. He goes up to a mountain, sits down with his disciples, and yet he looks with his eyes and beholds a multitude is coming after him. This is the good shepherd. And, of course, the good shepherd is inclined to feed. And so, in the midst of all this, it's testing time. Because Jesus turns to Philip and says, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? You ever had Jesus ask you a question like that? I mean, like something that's impossible to men that's only possible to God? Well, that was a question like this. And he said... He didn't have a very good response. And so he turned to Andrew, and of course, Andrew had a, a somewhat better response. He says, well, there is, there's a lad here. 
and he's got two fish and five, five loaves of bread. But what are they among so many? You remember how many there were? Well, the scripture records that it was 5,000 men, and for a long time I thought it was 5,000 people. I don't know why I, I just kind of picked that up. I don't know if I was ever taught that or not, but that was just the count of the men. And so who knows how many this might have been. It could have been anywhere from 20 to 25,000 people coming. I mean, I, that's like hard for me to fathom. I've never had to, I mean, it, it's an ordeal in my house when we invite a family of six over to feed them. Can you imagine looking? I mean, Jesus is talking to his disciples while the multitudes are coming to him. They're seeing thousands of people coming. And Jesus is intent on feeding them. It's a test time. That's what it is, brother. It's a test time. And God will test you too. He'll call you to do something that you cannot do without God. In fact, honestly, all of salvation is just that. It's just that. When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And you know, he did go ahead and feed the multitude. I think this is a marvelous part of Jesus' humility. First, I already told you one thing that I saw this morning. I didn't tell Brother Given and Sister June this, so let me repeat this because it was so good for me to see it. The scripture says that the Spirit makes this comment. And anytime the Spirit makes like an editorial comment, it's never just to give you a detail. There's something that God wants you to pick up in that. And the scripture says that he had the multitude sit down and says that there was much grass in that area. Now, now, Brother Given and Sister June, does that remind you of a text in Psalm 23 too? He makes you to lie down in green pastures. And I, that's the good shepherd. He comforted them so they could eat. That was marvelous. But in this miraculous feeding, what an act of humility because Jesus takes the bread and the fish and he blesses God and thanks God for it and prays for it. That's a marvelous act of humility on the part of Jesus. He honored his father before he even committed himself to this miracle. In other words, he was putting the name of God on this miracle. I have no doubt this was an open public blessing to God. And then the scripture says that Jesus didn't go around, of course, the multitudes. Jesus gave to the disciples. The disciples gave to the multitudes. If you want to be able to give bread to God's people, you've got to be where Jesus is. He is the ultimate feeder. You cannot feed without Jesus. And so he feeds the whole multitude. The scripture says this, and I love seeing the ways of Jesus in some of these details, some of these smaller details. But he says he gave them what they would. Surely you've been to a restaurant where you had a little dab of this and a little dab of this and a little piece of this and it cost you like 20 bucks. And, but Jesus isn't like this. It's not like this. You can eat as much as you want. And if you want more, you can eat more. You're only constrained by your own affections. That's the way it is because there's no limit with Jesus. And so he feeds the entire multitude and they eat all that they would so that their stomachs are entirely full. And then here comes the reaction of the multitudes. Here's where things didn't go so well. You may remember this. This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And you remember what they were going to do? The scripture says that Jesus perceived that they would come and make him a king by force. I get the idea that they were... This hadn't even, they haven't been talking about this yet. He could perceive that it was moving in this kind of a direction. And before there could even be this, this type of forcefulness, Jesus got out. Because Jesus didn't really come to the world to enhance your earthly life. And when they looked at this prophet, all they saw was someone who could feed their mouths and fill their stomachs. And Jesus, can he do that? Yes, but I think he could do that without coming into the world, and he certainly wouldn't have to die for anybody to do that. That is not why Jesus came to the world, is to feed mouths and become a king and to set up a kingdom on the earth like men think so. You see, I do not appreciate, and I am sure if you're born again, you do not appreciate either the attempt of men to wed heaven and earth. I do not appreciate that. 
Jesus did not appreciate that. And when their lusts were being controlled by earthly desires, he withdrew from the multitudes. He sends his disciples away. Remember, he sends them on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. While they're on the sea, there's this horrible, tempestuous wind that creates a terrible storm on the sea. And all their rowing is practically for naught. They just didn't make any, hardly any progress at all until the Son of God came walking upon the water. And you remember he got into the boat, and the scripture says that immediately they were on at land. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because the disciples were surrounded by supernatural activity every single day. In fact, John records that if all the miracles that Jesus had performed had been recorded in books, the earth could not contain them. I'm not saying this because I'm a miracle monger. I'm saying this that if you learn from what Jesus did in his miracles, it will aspire you to something beyond what you can get in this life. You do not come to someone that can multiply bread and ask for more bread. Amen. You are to aspire to something beyond this world. And Peter and the disciples saw. And they said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. Amen. You're offering something that we can't get anywhere. So anyways, they make their, 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 they're on the other side of the sea. The next day, the multitudes find out, of course, that his disciples had been carried away. Jesus was not with him, and that Jesus was not there. There are ships that come from Tiberias, and so they took ship and went over the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And when they found Jesus, remember what they said? Master, where have you been? Yeah. It's like saying, why did you leave without us? Mm -hmm. It was that kind of a, that kind of a question. Mm -hmm. And Jesus confronts him right away. Yes. Now, Jesus is... Jesus, let me tell you this. Jesus is seeker friendly as long as your desires are heavenly. Amen. But if your desires are earthly, Jesus is not so seeker friendly. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. You seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you were fed. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. And that's when he says this very famous exhortation that godly people know about. Labor not for the meat that perishes but for the meat that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give you. There are a lot of religious people that are laboring for meat that perishes. There are a lot of religious people that would turn Jesus to aspire to works that will not be everlasting, like feeding multitudes. Huh? Food for the body and the body for food, but God shall destroy both them and it. Right? It is a great danger to live for things that are, that are not eternal. It is a great danger, more than that, to have a religion that sanctifies earthly desires right. as the primary means by which men are pursuing Jesus. And that is dangerous. Because Jesus will not have it. He will not have it. Now, we know, we know of some of the more obvious things that are like this. Okay? And I know not everybody caught up in some of these kind of movements is in that category. So don't get me wrong when I say this. And I'm just going to mention it and move on because we say it a lot. But the health and wealth movement is one of those things. Is that really why Jesus came? Is so that you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise, as men call it? Is that really what it's about? And then you got to give it up when you die? Doesn't that fit into this category, though? Yeah. No. Don't they profess that to be like a primary blessing from yeah. God? Yeah. Is that really? Did Jesus really die for that? I think Jesus would have said to those, them just this very same thing. Right. Stop laboring for the meat that perishes. Mm -hmm. And yet many people are caught through covetousness yes. and trapped in that kind of a notion. Now, those are more obvious things, but there are other things that are a little more subtle. How about religious organization? A man can be all caught up in a denomination yes. and really have no love for Jesus or desire for eternal life. You remember the Pharisees when they were threatened by Jesus. Of all people to be threatened by Jesus were these sons of Abraham. 
But of course, Jesus said they really weren't truly the children of Abraham because they didn't receive him. And when Abraham heard the truth, he received it. But nonetheless, they should have received the Christ. It's a tragedy that he came to his own and his own received him not. And the Pharisees said, if we let him alone, the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation or our position. Now, brethren, there's an example of denominational love. That when Jesus shows up, it disrupts the religious organization. Bad sign. Have you not seen it so? When some person comes to life in Christ, they become the troublemaker in the church. Because as Christ is, is expressing himself through these people, and they're getting in trouble by the religious organization. You can love the religious organization and not love eternal life. You can labor as a minister without heaven in your eye. Hmm? And with things that are just temporary, that are religious things, being the primary things that motivate you and move you in life, it's a dangerous thing. But it's taking place all about us. How about this? And I know we've talked about this before, so I'll just hit this and move on. It's possible to say that you're raising your children in the nurture and administration of the Lord, but really your primary satisfaction is in your children rather than in the God you are professing to raise them for. It's possible for you to love your wife more than you love Christ and love your husband more than you love Christ, and all the while saying that we are trying to depict the likeness of Christ in the church while you're really being moved along by earthly desires. You see, marriage isn't going to go into the world to come. That's right. Anything that isn't going to transfer into the world to come can be a liability if it's not sanctified by a desire for eternal life. Amen. Now, I'm not saying here that these are areas where you ought to be yes. lax and lazy. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. Not at all what I'm saying. It's rather you give yourself fully to it with eternal life being your primary ambition. Yes, and then the temporary things, the, what the scripture calls the fashion of this world, will not be your liability. You have to watch this every day, brethren. Every day, all that we do has to be sanctified by the desire for eternal life, or it gets Jesus upset. It gets Jesus upset. As soon as men are laboring for something Jesus did not come to give to men, you're in a dangerous path. You know, all false teaching encourages men to want something Jesus did not come to give them. I'm talking what he primarily came to give them. Can Jesus feed a multitude? Yes. Can he assist your marriage? Yes. He can do that. He can do these things. He can help you in these things. But is that really why he came? No. I'm going to affirm that he's the bread of God that came down from heaven and because he came down from heaven, he is the one qualified to give the life that comes from heaven, from God, to suit you for heaven. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Amen. Okay? And so he confronts them. And in the midst of all this, Sister Bailey already mentioned, but now Moses gave us bread from heaven, which wasn't true at all. Moses didn't give you that bread. Moses didn't give you that bread. But God gives you the true bread. Amen. And what is the true bread? I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Now, let me tell you, brethren, that is an affirmation of the deity of Jesus Christ. I'm afraid that men are too prone to make Jesus too human. You know what I mean by that? Let me just say what I mean by that, because don't get me wrong. I confess that Jesus came in the flesh, so don't get me wrong. But I'm afraid men's notions of what Jesus is as a man is a little too earthly. You know what I'm saying? And that men do not understand enough about the deity of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not here to like criticize as if I've, I've come. I'm, this is a very large subject and something I'm learning in, but I do know this, that Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven, yes. and that can't be said of any other man. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
It is a profession of his deity, and it's not the first time that he's spoken like this. Let me give you some of the others. And any time Jesus repeats something, it's time for us to perk our ears up. There's something he wants us to get a hold of and keep, as has already been said. John chapter 3, verse 13. No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. He came down from heaven, he's in heaven. Yes. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 31. He that came from above is above all. Those are the words of John the Baptist. He that is of the earth is earthly. Did you realize he was talking about himself there? That is, my origin, John the Baptist says, is in the earth. His origin wasn't. Henceforth, bridegroom, <laughs> best man. Let's get that order right. And he speak of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. That's the Son of God. He came from heaven. John chapter 6, verse 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father gave you the, the true bread from heaven. It's come down from heaven. John chapter 6, and verse 33. The bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Don't miss those connections. Him giving life as someone who is from heaven. Very important. John chapter 6, verse 50. This is the bread which came down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. What we have here, brethren, is a testimony to the pre-existence of Christ before his incarnation. He came down from heaven before he was born. This is so important to see this. So, um, do not assume that people can see and understand the deity of Jesus Christ. To me, this is the thing that, G that people are missing. You know, the more that I come to understand about the deity of Christ, the more I am compelled to submit to him and to serve him. If he's your buddy, you're more apt to disobey him. But if he's the Lord of heaven, if he is really in body the fullness of the Godhead, if he really is the image of the living God, if Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, then he's worthy to be submitted to and worshipped. Mm -hmm. And if he is the only one in whom all this fullness dwells, then he's the only one that I need to seek for life and godliness. Amen. Why don't people do this? Because they do not understand the deity of Jesus Christ. That's why they're doing that. That's why all these programs are out there. That's why there are substitutes for Jesus. People do not understand this about Jesus. So let's look at this for just a second. Think about his commission. The scripture says it this way in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. When did we get our commission, brethren? Did you get it before you were born? Jesus got his before he was born. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world... When he cometh into the world, he saith. Did you speak, you know, before you were in the world? He spoke before he was in the world. Right. When he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering uh -huh. thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Yes. When, he, when he cometh into the world, this is what he said. Jesus had a determination before he came into the world. He spoke before he came into the world. See, there are people that deny this. They think that Jesus is a created being. No, Jesus is not a created being. He's the Son of God. And before he came into the world, he received his commission from God. He saw in the roll of the book, it was written of him. He knew God wasn't satisfied because the sacrifices didn't take away sin. And he said, you prepared a body for me. And I'm coming to do what you've called me to do. Well, that's marvelous. To, so that's something you just want to think on. You want to think on that and consider that. Consider his work. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, Jesus worked before he was born. Look at everything you see about you. All the land, all the sea, the creatures, all the fullness thereof, that which comes out of the water, that which creeps on the land. It was all created by Jesus. Every bit of it. Colossians 1, 16 affirms this. For by him were all things created. Of course, as you know, it's not only limited to the world. That are in heaven, that created things in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, 
Now listen to this. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. He created everything. Powers, all of them have been created by him. And I'll tell you right now, I say this a lot, but anything that he has created is not out of his control. If you can just sit down and meditate on what he has created, it will bring the peace of Christ to you. You know, Jesus never had any trouble with creation. I'm going to get to that here in just a little bit. All things were subject unto him, evidently subject unto him. Although we do not presently see all things subject unto man, do we? Unbeknownst to what some people say. They think it's subject to him, but it's not. But it was all subject to Christ. Why? Because he created it. He created it, and it was created by him, and it was created for him. When you know that you were created for him, it inclines your heart to serve him. That's part of his deity. He's a creator. In this miracle of the bread, I think that was a marvelous thing that after Jesus says, gather up the fragments that remain, that there be nothing lost, and they gathered up more than they had when they began. Brother Tony, we were conjecturing about this. Brother Tony thought maybe the disciples didn't get a chance to eat, and so Jesus gave them a meal so that they could, you know, have something to eat afterwards. I don't know if that's true or not, but nonetheless, if they had more after everyone ate to their fill than he had when he started, he created it. See, he's the creator. He is. Jesus had a pre-world existence. John chapter 17, verse 5, Jesus is praying to the Father in heaven and says, Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Before the world was, Jesus is. You know, when Jesus says, I am, that is not an affirmation that is tied with time. Yes, that's right. Yes, amen. He is the I am just as the Father is the I am. I am, which means at any point in history you can go to it. Go to Abraham's day. He rejoiced to see my day and was glad. And in Abraham's day, Jesus could say, I am. And it was true. Couldn't be said of you. Can be said of him. It's also if you go clear into the future. You see, Melchizedek is like the Son of God, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Jesus was born, but he had no beginning. Now, I understand there are borders to that that we can't understand, but I'm just going to say what the Scripture has said. This is part of who he is as the Son of God, and I'm telling you, this is the point on which the Jews persecuted him. This is the point. As long as he was just feeding multitudes, he'd have been okay. But it was in his teaching and especially in this profession to be the son of God that caused them to persecute him. It was like the parable that Jesus taught. If we kill the son, then we'll have the vineyard for ourselves. He is the son of God. Think about his knowledge. You remember when the disciples, they were sent away and Jesus gave them power over demons and they were so glad. They came back and they were rejoicing because the demons were subject to us. Isn't this wonderful? And Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. You think you've seen something. And you know, there's no great commentary on that. He just hits it and moves on. It's like... He's got a knowledge base that is beyond this world. Huh? I mean, in the beginning, we find Jesus, we find, sorry, we find Satan as a serpent in the garden. In a sense, he'd already made his fall. Jesus isn't talking about the time he enters into heaven. That's not what he's talking about. We're not talking about the intercessor entering into heaven and Michael and the angels fighting with the devil. That hadn't happened yet because the basis for justification had not yet been established. I saw Satan. I saw it. This was not an eyewitness. I saw him fall from heaven like lightning. 
Now, brother, this is a side issue, but God doesn't have trouble with his enemies. Amen. You know, the Satan, the Satan that's causing you trouble, uh -huh. difficulty, the one that you have to wrestle with, the one that is your enemy, yeah. God doesn't have trouble with him. That's right. It is so important that we understand that neither God nor Jesus struggles with enemies. Mm -hmm. The real issue with you and your struggle against the enemy is your trust toward Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because God himself said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand right. and my father that gave them unto me is greater than all yeah. and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand yes. why are they kept simple answer because the father is greater than all yes. And if you put your faith in God, God will not let Satan yes. overthrow your faith. Yes. Yes. See, this is, this was such an encouragement to me. Yes. Amen. I'm not divine. Mm -hmm. I'm not. No, there are weaknesses that I wrestle with. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about sinful compromises. Don't get me wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. But Jesus is strong. Yes. And he's always strong yeah. and always sufficient. Amen. And his strength is made perfect in weakness. Yes. He, like God, never sleeps nor slumbers. Mm -hmm. He's the bread that came down from heaven. I hope we're seeing that. I hope I'm not getting too far out from that. Uh -huh. I'm, just, I'm just encouraging you about his divinity. Now, consider the miracles of Jesus because he did these things every day. It's like these miracles were calling his disciples out of the world. Yes. If you could see the miracles right, that's what they would do. I mean, if you really, if you could look at the miracles right, you would say things to Jesus like, you would want to hear about like eternal life. Tell us more about eternal life. Because we know you're not an ordinary man. Okay, look at these miracles real quick, just real quickly. Some of these miracles. I'm saying this because when John wrote in John chapter 20, verse 31, he talked about these signs. I used to for a long time kind of despise miracles because I know of the miracle mongers that are out there. I understand. It made me kind of despise the miracles. I know it's not right. I know that's not right, that that should happen. But then it came across this John 20, 31, and he says, these are written that you might believe. They're written by the Holy Spirit, handpicked, recorded these miracles. Amen. Not to encourage you to become a miracle monger, so to speak, but to encourage you that what kind of man is this? It should have provoked at least that. Think about some of these miracles real quickly. Jesus turns water into wine. The scripture says on that occasion in John 2, 11, remember there was no great procedure associated with this. He just told him to fill these jars of four or five firkins apiece and just told him, draw it out. And that was the end of the matter. The wine was there, which normally takes some time. Didn't take any time at all. Just like that. Draw it out. Best wine that they had had. New wine. Marvelous marvelous miracle and the scripture records that this was the beginning of miracles that Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him not as a not as a bread maker but as someone who was doing what no man can do that kind of faith that kind of faith now that's what faith does brethren it believes on God to do what no man can do okay and so he did that marvelous miracle. Jesus spoke life out of a fig tree. He went up to that fig tree. It had leaves as if it should have had figs, and it didn't. Is unfruitfulness real serious with Jesus? Huh? Is Jesus a mamby-pamby Jesus? He didn't see figs when he expected there to be figs, and he said... No more shall fruit come forth from me henceforth and forever. Never will you bear fruit again. And then he turned to his disciples. Remember the scripture comments that it dried up from the roots up. Why don't you give it a try? Give it a try. Next time you're out some kind of tree, just kind of give it a try. No fruit grow on you henceforth and forever. Well, if God gives you the ability, you can do it. Jesus could do it at will. And he turned to his disciples and said, have faith in God. 
Quite a miracle, wasn't it? Jesus turned a funeral procession into a time of rejoicing. You know, I love funerals, and I love to preach at funerals, and I love to tell people what the Bible says about death at funerals because they're serious. Remember Moses? Remember Moses and his prayer in the Psalms? Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Because when a man's at a funeral and the, and the awareness of his mortality comes upon him, there's a little bit less rejoicing in earthly things. You notice that? In fact, people that are earthly tend to kind of clam up at funerals, where people that are godly tend to kind of rejoice at funerals. But nonetheless, here's this widow of Nain. This is her only son that has died, and they are carrying him out to bury him. The scripture says that Jesus put his hand out and touched the carriage. He just touched the carriage. And in an instant, the scripture says that that man, he sat up and began to speak. I'll tell you, that's a marvelous thing. If you see men that are dominated by death, think about this. Jesus just has to speak, and they can live. They can do that. See, I'm telling you, Jesus has surrounded his disciples with extraordinary things to encourage them when they hear the word life to think beyond the world. That's what these miracles encourage them to do. Jesus made a raging storm turn into a sea of glass in a moment of time. You remember that? Here are the disciples. They're on this raging sea. The scripture says and records about it that the water had actually filled up the bow of the boat. I mean, it had filled up. And you know what happens when a boat fills up? It begins to go down to the sea level. I get the idea that that's what's happening. This boat is like going down to sea level. Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. Man, talk about the peace of Christ. Can you have that kind of peace? If you have life from God, you can. You can have that kind of peace. And I'll tell you, I want to learn to do this. I'm glad that Jesus can calm the storm, but I want to learn to be calm while the storm is going on. To me, that seems to be more superior. I'm talking about spiritual life here. This is the manner of spiritual life. Jesus has just demonstrated. He wakes up, and before he calms the sea, he rebukes his disciples because he has a captive audience. Master, we perish. Where is your faith? And the scripture says he rebuked the sea. He can rebuke a man. He can rebuke a sea. He can rebuke a sea. And it was perfectly calm. Well, there are many more miracles, brethren. And here in our text, Jesus feeds a multitude with one young lad's lunch. Mm -hmm. And everybody had enough. Why is his deity so important? And I hope this will come across very clearly. God has demonstrated in the earth that when life springs forth, the life that comes from it comes forth after its kind. Uh There in Genesis, as God was creating, that is exactly what happened. That when the the life of the sea began to teem, the scripture says that it came forth after its kind. When the land animals began to to multiply, they were springing forth after their kind. Jesus said that a good good tree brings forth good fruit. A corrupt tree brings forth corrupt fruit. If you go to a fig tree, you expect to find figs. Because the fruit that comes forth from it is after the likeness of the source from which that life came. Jesus said it this way, whatsoever is flesh is flesh, whatsoever is spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said unto thee, you must be born again. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, we pick up this marvelous word that speaks of two men that represent the likeness from which the entire race has come, one being Adam, who is of the earth. Jesus becomes that second man who is from heaven. And here's how Paul reasons about this. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, 
You understand why it's so crazy to go from natural to spiritual back to natural again? How foolish this is to look at the Lord of heaven and to have all of your desires absorbed in what's natural. Yes, the first man was natural, but the second isn't. Right. He's spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy, which means he can't be anything but earthy. Look at your body. Everything about your body has a, a tie to this world. You need to be able to hear. You have ears to be able to hear. You have to have that. You've got eyes. They're useful for looking around and seeing things that are in the earth. Your body is suited for this world. That's part of this earthly man. But there is a second man. The second man is the Lord from heaven. He is the living bread which came down from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. But as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, and have we? Yes, we have. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Amen. Why is the deity of Christ so central? Because it qualifies Jesus to give you the life of God. So that you could be born, brother, not of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, both books that John writes, he opens up by affirming the deity and he ties the deity of Christ to the life that he came to give. Yes. I think it's marvelous that he's done this. It's just wonderful. Let me, let me just give you this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Mm -hmm. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He's not just taking a quantum leap. Yeah. He's telling you, brethren, that his deity is what is qualifying him to give you life from God. Not an earthly life because his source isn't from the earth. Mm -hmm. He had come from heaven uh -huh. to give you the life that suits you for heaven. Yeah. Uh -huh. I hope that's coming across clearly because that was so... Wonderful to see that. And so let's just, I'm just going to close by looking at this just real quick. Life from the Lord of heaven suits us for heaven, which ultimately has to do with dwelling with the God of heaven, who is the premier person in heaven. This is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Okay? Now think about this. For one, our Father is in heaven. Our Father. In fact, Jesus taught his disciples, pray our Father which art in heaven. That's not a metaphor. It's a reality. I don't like it when people say stupid stuff like that. John chapter 20 and verse 17. Jesus meets Mary. And these marvelous words proceed forth from him. Here is Jesus freshly resurrected. And his words are filled with hope. Yeah. I mean, Mary comes to this grave with heaviness of heart. Yeah. Certainly you've had experiences like this. You come to like, to, you're like in a grave setting. And you're heavy of heart. But then Jesus meets you in the grave setting. And he speaks words that make you pop right out of the grave setting. I, it's just wonderful. And he says this, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren. Yeah. Well, I like it when Jesus refers to me as his brethren. Yes, Don't right. you? Yeah. You're included in that. That's right. You're part of his brethren. Go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, yes. unto my God yeah. and your God. Yeah. He's our Father. That's right. And He's heavenly. Mm -hmm. He's our heavenly Father. More than that, our habitation is now in heavenly places yes. by faith. Amen. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. See, God's not in the habit of throwing blessings. We've said that before, but it's <laughs> I know it's kind of like a it's kind of like a hackneyed phrase, but it's a truth. Uh -huh. 
The reason why you are able to receive a blessing from God is because you are in heavenly places. Yes. Otherwise, you couldn't. That's right. You couldn't. Yeah. Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. I mean, you can't be with Christ and not be in heavenly places. Amen. How is that possible? I mean, Jesus didn't stay in the world. He left. Yeah. Uh -huh. He left the world. Yeah. That ought to be a commentary right there on the divine value system. It's not on this world. That's right. Amen. And you remember why he went. Remember John 14, why he went. Yeah. Get to that in here in just a second. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. In the first chapter, he tells us, he opens up by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Yeah. You're able to receive from God now because of where you are. Yeah. It's because of where you are. Mm -hmm. Have you found that as you're growing, you're able to receive more? Yes. It's because your faith is increasing. Yeah. Uh -huh. Everything you have from God, you have by faith. And being seated in the heavenly places is just like that. Mm -hmm. But that's where this life thrives, yeah. uh -huh. is in heavenly places. Yeah. That's a blessing. Think of this. Our citizenship is in heaven. Yes. You know, Jesus said in John 17 that he sent his disciples into the world. I thought they were already there. But they were going into the world now as citizens from heaven. In heaven, that is where they're from now. That's how God views it. They're part of the household. Now they're ambassadors. They're being sent out, but they're from heaven. That's how it's viewed in heaven. I'll tell you, that's marvelous. Our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body all that trouble you have that's associated with that body now brother and I know at times that we can be we can be brought low because of the trouble but just remember the trouble is there because of the contrariety between where that body had its origin and where you now have your origin you're a citizen of heaven. Yes, yes, we are. That's why you got trouble. Uh -huh. But now Jesus says, I got a body prepared for you. Yeah. Those who are citizens of heaven, I got a heavenly body yeah. prepared just for you. Amen. Now God's purpose is one day to give the saints the kingdom of heaven. That's his pleasure. He is in this text in Luke 12 encouraging the brethren to not be consumed with earthly things. And he says, Seek not that which you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither be of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, don't they? People make a big deal out of eating and drinking, don't they? Now your father knoweth that you have need of these things but rather seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. The bread of God that came down from heaven, life that comes from heaven that prepares you, brethren, to sit in Jesus' throne and to abide in heaven and to be part of the ruling of the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you can see that, it will encourage you not to be consumed with the earth. I'm just telling you, I hope this, this truth is coming across. This is the bread of God that has come down from heaven. What I've wanted to show you, and I'll just conclude with this. What I've wanted to show you in all this is when you look at everything that Jesus has said about life, and he said a whole lot more. I had a whole lot more here that I was going to look at. Some of the promises tied with life and these kind of things. But you just can't take the promises that Jesus has tied with life that he talks about and fit it into the context of what's temporary, of what's tangible, and of what's earthly. It just doesn't fit. Why? Because Jesus didn't come down here to enhance your life in the world. And when these people wanted a bread maker, he sent them away. And he tells them, and I tell you, 
don't labor for the meat that perishes in all that we do. And this is something that you learn in sanctification. And it's like a continuing thing. This is part of fighting the good fight of faith. That all that you do and all the stewardship you have and things that are temporary, it has to be compelled and driven by what's eternal. It has to be. That's the work of faith, to learn to make that tie so that everything that you're committed to, that is temporary. There's a number of things that we have to commit to that are temporary, but we can do them with heaven in our eye. And remember all the things that Jesus has said about this life. Because, brethren, Jesus is preparing you for glory, Amen. for heaven. Amen. And he said this, you believe in God. I'll just finish with this last word. You believe in God, believe also in me. Yes. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, and has he gone? He's gone. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may also be. So all you do in life, it has to somehow tie to that. Yes. That's right. Amen. And that's what walking by faith is all about, brother. And this is a marvelous life he's given us. We're just in the beginning of it, but it is a heavenly life. Thank you. Amen.